In 1989, engineer and scientist Maurice Cotterell found a way of calculating the duration of long-term magnetic reversals on the sun. Using this knowledge, he was able to break the codes of ancient sun-worshipping uh, sun civilizations. First, the Mayans of Central America, those of Tutankhamun of Egypt and the Viracochas of South America, before cracking the codes of the terracotta warriors of China. And we are going to discuss with him how the 12-year Chinese astrological calendar is simply a metaphor to describe the effects of the 11 and a half year sunspot cycle on human personality and behavior. And this is a beautiful book that you have written, The Future Science, Forbidden, or Future Science, Forbidden Science of the 21st Century. It would take 12 hours to, to go through this minimum, but it's just an extraordinary work. And welcome to the program. We cannot wait to hear what you have to say tonight. Thank you, John. Where shall we begin? Before, before you explain to us how astrology works, uh, tell me this. Tell us this. You figured out how astrology works around 25 years ago and have since then included the mechanism in uh, many of your books, best-selling books that are available in more than 20 languages worldwide. So why has the mainstream media refused to share your discoveries with the public, and why do they continually pretend that astrology cannot work and cannot be explained scientifically? That word again. Well, uh, as most of the coast-to-coast -coast listeners appreciate, John, the mainstream media is run by the establishment, and the establishment is run by the Freemasons. And they know that if they tell you how astrology works, you'll be able to figure out everything else, like what God is, what heaven is, what hell is, how to get to heaven, even how gravity works. And all of this is explained in future science. Well, as I say, this um, this is a this is an extraordinary work. It really is. It's. Um, I wish this was uh, televised. That day may come. W what's wrong with that? Why 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 shouldn't we all know about it? Why would they want to? Why would they want? Isn't there more for them to gain by general enlightenment uh, among the populace and to keep, just keep it restricted to the chosen few? Well, uh, yes and no, John. The problem is, if you start explaining how to get to heaven to people, uh, that's fine. The problem is, once you figure out how to get to heaven, it's easy to figure out how to send other people's souls to hell. And that's why the knowledge is kept secret by the Freemasons, because in the wrong hands it can be dangerous. What kind of world would we be living in if everybody started sending the soul of their adversaries to hell? That's not why we're born. We're born to purify our own soul, to get our own soul back to God, where it came from originally. And that's why this knowledge has to be kept secret. Uh, clearly, if you, if you inquire, if you fly through the astrological window, uh, as I've already said, you can figure out all of this stuff before. And I've been fortunate in that I was the first person in our current era who has flown through that astrological window, figured out how astrology works, figured out how the sun affects us. And because of that, it's like pulling on a thread on a sweater, a loose thread. You pull on that small thread and the whole picture unravels. And uh, it's, it's just once you get into this kind of knowledge, it's beautiful. Uh, but uh, I do have some sympathy for the Freemason cause, if you like, because uh, it's not for everybody, this knowledge. As I say, in the wrong hands, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And therefore, it's not for everybody. It's for coast-to-coast -coast listeners who are different, who are special, who ask questions, who want to know the answers to why we live, why we die, and why this has to be. And so it's not for everybody. The Bible says it's for the 144,000. It's, it's for the few. So uh, that's what we'll be talking about uh, this evening. Physics has made virtually no progress at all in the last 75 years. It's remarkable. Whereas against engineering, for example, and technology, engineering and technology has, has capitalized upon all previous uh, scientific discoveries. The science itself seems to be in a loop. It's going round and round in circles. And it seemed to me that somewhere a carriage must have derailed. It seems as though 
the, 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 the scientific carriage jumped off the rails and we've not got anywhere for 75 years. So I decided to go back and examine the work of Ernest Rutherford of the 1920s, a physicist in the UK who was the first to split the atom, and uh, have a look at the work of James Chadwick, the chemist of 1935. And they were the two uh, primary uh, figures who ascertained that the atom was made of positive charges in the middle, which was orbited by negative charges on the outside. And it was Chadwick in 1935 who discovered that there was also another particle which had no charge. He called it the, uh, the neutron because it was neutral right. inside, inside the middle of the atom. Now, that's all very well, but if you look at their pictures of the atom, a few things jump out at you straight away. And these, these are what I call the 12 great mysteries of physics. These are three of them. And the first one is if the atom is made of positive charges in the middle, then like red billiard balls, if you like, clustered together. Why don't they all spring apart if they're all positive? Because positive repels positive. Right. The second uh, interesting question, which any six- or seven-year-old should be asking, is if the, uh, the negative charges orbit the middle of the atom, why don't they get sucked into the middle? Because positive attracts negative. Now, why haven't these problems been addressed? A third question is, why do the electrons orbit in different shells, some close to the nucleus of the atom and others further away? Now, when you why say shells, they... is that the same as orbits, Maurice? It is. It's like orbits. It's like a little solar system. Like uh, the planet Mercury is closer to the sun. Then we have the planet Venus further out. And further out from the sun, we have the planet Earth and, and uh so on, all throughout the solar system. And the atom is, is very similar in that two electrons orbit the sun very, very close to it, and then eight electrons orbit the uh, sun, so the atom further away. And uh, we also know from experiments in the 40s and 50s that these shells, these orbits, are offset to each other by 45 degrees, and nobody understands why. In fact, as soon as we start to look into physics, it's all very iffy and conjectural and speculative. And you, got, you start scratching your head thinking, what have these guys been doing for 75 years? Because it's not just the atom. You know, clearly we don't understand why objects fall to the ground. We don't understand gravity. But we don't even understand why a magnet sticks to the fridge door. You know, uh, in fact, so little do they know about magnetism that they named it after the word magic because they, they, they see it as a magic net, a magnet. This is, it's, it's unbelievable that the guy in the street doesn't realize how he's had the wool pulled over his eyes for so long. We don't understand what electricity is. If you connect a battery to a wire, an electric current flows, but nobody knows why a magnetic field appears around the wire. Now, this is unbelievable. And then they start, the physicists started to make things up when they couldn't come up with the answers. And they started to ask questions like, why do stars cluster together? Because if you do the calculations, there doesn't appear to be enough gravity. So they started to make up stories. And they said, well, there must be more planets out there that we can't see, dark planets. Let's call them dark matter. And, of course, it's only because their calculations don't work out. If they did their calculations again, they would find that there is no need for dark matter. And they say, why uh, are galaxies spiral-shaped? Why, why does a sp uh, each galaxy have a double spiral? They, they haven't got a clue. What drives the sunspot cycle? They don't know. What causes global warming and global cooling? They don't know. Now, these are just 12. 12. There's actually two more. There's actually 14 great mysteries of physics. But two, we have to accept, for example, that the charges, positive and negative, attract each other. We have to start somewhere. And we also have to start with a notion of a field, a magnetic field, which these two haven't yet been explained. But I address the 12 great mysteries of physics, and I solve them all in the book in a very, very simple way. All we have to do is change the shape of the electron and the neutron, and we can then understand why the atom doesn't spring apart. Once we understand how the atom doesn't spring apart, we can understand how gravity works. Once we understand how gravity works, we can then go backwards and fight, figure out how magnetism works and how a magnetic field appears around a wire. 
And again, once we put all these pieces into place, we can understand why we don't need dark matter, we don't need dark energy. Uh, there are no questions. It's all very, very simple. But the problem is there is too much of an incentive for physicists who get grants to do work. They get billions and billions of dollars to build more and more sophisticated machines to try to smash the atom into little bits, looking for glue. I mean, their answer to the problem of why don't uh, the uh, positive charges spring apart in the atom Years ago, in 1935, a guy named Yukawa, a researcher, said, well, they must be glued together. These little red billiard balls must be glued together. Let's look for the glue. And since 1935, they've built these uh, ex particle accelerators at $5 billion each, smashing the particles apart, trying to look for glue. In fact, they're now looking for 300 types of glue, and none of it exists and you don't need any of it once you sit down and think about the problem and uh, all the pieces fall into place so and then, we're back to the ether again that's a, that uh, that Morley and his partner thought bound the universe together and, it, and it's not there it's not there no of course not it's not there it's not necessary it's just a vacuum and of course we the forces of nature are three there is uh, electricity magnetism and electricity and magnetism working together produce gravity electricity and magnetism and gravity are three sides of the same coin you've got the head the tail and the side and uh, when you have a look at how the electron orbits the atom you can see how it all works an electron is not like a little billiard ball. It's actually a coil shaped. It's like a little piece of wire round, wrapped around a pencil. And as it orbits the uh, atom, it slices through the electric field between the proton and the electron. A magnetic field is induced into the electron, causing it to twist and to spin. And that uh, the spinning uh, electron magnet, I call it an electron magnet because it's not just an electron. It's, half of the time it's an electrical particle, an electron. Half of the time it's a magnetic particle, a magnet, so I call them electron magnets. And once you get your head about around how electron magnets work, it's child's play. And you can see how the universe works, how it's held together. And from that point, you can then get on to Einstein's E equals MC squared, which explains what God is. Now, Einstein never knew that. I mean, Einstein didn't even realize when he figured out his famous equation, E equals mc squared. That's m energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. He had no idea that it would lead to a, nu uh, a nuclear bomb in his, in his day, in 1910 and 1912, when he came up with relativity. It was only in 1938 that... Uh, I think it was Otto Frisch who discovered that it, the energy contained in the atom was far more uh, and it could be released if, if under the right conditions of the atom bomb. Uh, but what Einstein also didn't realize was that his equation explains what God is. And it's all very, it's just it's very sad because I think he was spiritually predisposed and, he, you know, he said that God doesn't play dice and I agree with him there. God doesn't take chances, God doesn't play dice. Everything is organized and it's so beautiful it's just it's so beautiful the how it all works and how simple it is and how it all begins and continues and ends and how reincarnation works and why we have to live and it's just wonderful stuff as, as i'm sure you appreciate having looked at the book oh absolutely would you just just very quickly would you would you agree that everything is do you agree that everything is made out of the same stuff that everything is made of stardust Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, we're all made out of uh, atoms, uh, and the atoms uh, come from the, uh, the, the, the hydrogen atom, the heavy hydrogen atom on the sun, which is called deuterium, which is slightly different to the, the hydrogen we have on Earth. All, there are 120 different types of atom, and this is explained in the book again. Maurice Cotterell, Future Science. On Coast to Coast AM. You were talking just briefly a moment ago about stardust. Are we from stardust? And indeed, the, the answer is yes. And the 120 elements come from the stardust, the 120 different materials on Earth, the fundamental materials that cannot be reduced uh, beyond their natural state. There's 120 of those. And uh, th there's two types of electromagnetic energy. There is atomic electromagnetic energy, which is generated as the electron orbits the nucleus of the atom. 
Now that is what I call spirit. It is electromagnetic energy, but it is spirit. This is what the Red Indians used to refer to as the spirit in the rocks, the spirit in the mountains, the spirit in the clouds, the spirit in the, the streams and so on. But there's also something else which is called a soul. Now soul is voltage again, uh, but it's in a different form. Now it's uh, what Einstein's saying is energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And in the Bible, it says that God, in the beginning, was light. And the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu Bible, also said that God is light. It says quite explicitly that God is light. In the Bible, it's one step further. It says God said, let there be light, and he created light from his initial uh, manifestation. Now, uh, God is light, therefore God is electromagnetic energy. We now know that with our 20th century understanding, our 21st century now. And therefore, we have to come to terms with, well, how did the universe begin? Well, Einstein says that the energy was converted into mass. So some of God must have been converted into mass. And it's very, very simple again. It really is simple to understand. It's, it's interesting, and it's, uh, it's simple to see what God is and what hell is and what heaven is. And it's very, very simple, and I'll explain it. Let's say that in the beginning, it, it does help to give figures to these uh, numbers, numbers to the, this explanation. Let's say, for example, that God, in the beginning, was a million volts of light, electromagnetic energy. Now, the Bible tells us that uh, God is good and God is love. So the only thing better than God must be more God, because that's more good, it's more love. But the Bible also tells us that God cannot grow uh, because we know that because he said he made man in his own image, and man cannot grow. A man can only grow if he sacrifices his genes his, in a sperm. A woman can only grow beyond a certain size if she sacrifices her uh, chromosomes in an ovum, an egg. So God is telling us that he can't grow. It's as though he can do everything else in the universe. He can do all kinds of miracles, but he can't grow because he made man in his own image, and man can't grow. So because more God is more good, God wants to grow. Now, in order to grow, God created the physical universe, and we are a conduit by which God can grow. He gets bigger and bigger, and the, 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 the universe becomes more loving. And how this happens, as I say, if we give them these, these, uh, this, this mechanism, voltages we start off with god for example with a million volts so god sacrifices a piece of himself it's the only way to grow just like we sacrifice the chromosomes the 200,000 let's say he sacrifices 200,000 volts that goes to the other side of einstein's equation now what happens is very interesting now because if you go back to your days at school aged about 10 or 11 if you take something from one side of the equation and put it on the other side the algebraic sign changes so if it's positive it becomes negative if it's negative it becomes positive so if god is plus one million volts and he sacrifices two hundred thousand it goes to the other side of the equation and becomes minus two hundred thousand and then physics tells us that the minus two hundred thousand volts had a big bang and it exploded and created the physical universe that we see around us the planets the rocks the stars the trees living things and so on so what we see is if God lives in heaven and he's now gone down, his voltage has gone down to 800,000 volts, he's in heaven, then the 200,000 that went to the other side of the equation, which became negative, must be the opposite of God. So that must be hell. It's got to be. What that means is that everything in the physical universe is hell. So we're all living in hell. So then what happened is after the Big Bang, when the planets were formed and the stars, we had evolution and time began. And cells became more and more complex. Until at a given point during evolution, mankind generated a sufficient voltage in the womb. In other words, when the sperm entered the egg, the cells began to divide. The nervous system began to be developed. Voltages were developed inside the physical body. But these are all minus voltages because they're all in hell. But what happens is when you get, 
When you get a body with minus, for example, five volts, a baby with minus five volts driving its brain, making it think, moving its arms and its legs, the minus five volts rips off plus five volts from God. It has a propensity to tear off a voltage to balance the body's voltage. So the baby's voltage of minus five volts, when it's born, rips off plus five volts from God, and that plus five volts is like a battery. And the plus five volts and the minus five volts cancel each other, and we get what we now know is a human being with a body and a soul. How is this measured, Maurice? Uh, it's not measured. It, we can see it by the mechanism. If we examine the mechanism, the, the voltages I'm, I'm mentioning are arbitrary. That This is just used to explain the mechanism. They could be microvolts. They could be millivolts. They could be uh, digital volts, analog volts. They could be frequencies. They could be uh, binary. They, 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 could, they could come in any form. I'm just using the figures now to try to help the explanation on its way. Oh. Now, once a baby is born, it's a human being. And uh, the human beings, we, we actually have four bodies, not just a physical body. We have an emotional body, which is the brain. We ha sorry, the heart. We have an intellectual body, which is the brain. We have a physical body, which is the, all of the cells in the body. And we have a spiritual body, which is the soul inside, the battery that we dragged off God uh, just before we were born. Now, these four bodies... Uh, have different rules and they exist in different worlds. For example, in the physical world, if I have a dollar and you have a dollar and we exchange them, we finish up with a, do uh, a dollar each. So there's, there's no gain. There's, you don't get something for nothing in the physical world. However, in the intellectual world, the rules are different. If I have one idea and you have one idea and we exchange them, then I finish up with two ideas and you finish up with two ideas. We can double our intellectual wealth at no cost. Now, we can use the same argument, but take it one step further. If I love you, then my soul voltage will go up. And if I hate you, my soul voltage goes down. So if I love everybody and everything in the world, then when I die, my voltage might increase, for example, during my lifetime from 5 volts to 50 volts, so much so that the energy in my brain releases a, a, a halo of light around my head. And this is why high voltage souls are depicted in ancient pictures with halos around their heads. Then what happens is when the body dies, when the cells are damaged or sick, the, the, the minus voltage from the body can no longer hold on to the positive voltage of God and the soul is released. And providing the voltage is high enough on the soul, it migrates, it escapes from the Earth's magnetic field and the Earth's gravitational field, and it goes back to God. So God grows by 45 volts. If, in the beginning, don't forget, he gave away 5 volts to the baby, but he gets 50 volts back. So God gets bigger, the uni uh, love gets bigger, and the universe expands, and uh, everything is good, and, and so on. Of course, conversely, if I were to hate you during my lifetime, then my uh, soul voltage would go down. When it leaves my body, it could not leave the Earth's gravitational field or magnetic field, so it would come back not as five volts, but maybe as a half a volt, if I've hated lots of people. And it would look for a collection of biological cells which are beginning to develop on Earth, something which is half a volt. It might be a flower, it might be a worm, it might be a dog. But as those cells divide and multiply, they generate a negative voltage, and they're looking for a positive voltage uh, to balance out the charges. So let's say a flower is beginning to, to grow. The, the minus half a volt from my body would go to the flower, and the flower would become... Uh, a living thing, again, with a, a body and a soul. The soul is only half a volt. And this is why the Maya believed that this life was illusion, because the flower might look like a flower and feel like a flower and smell like a flower, but it's, it's not a flower. It's God in disguise. Every living thing is God in disguise. Everything has a voltage like a battery which has been ripped off God, except rocks and streams, inanimate objects. They have spirit because they have atomic energy the electrons going around the atoms but they don't have the soul and it's like your computer if you plug your computer into the socket the voltage brings your computer alive if you unplug it your volt your computer dies 
God is electromagnetic energy. God is what drives me. It's what gives me life. Take away my voltage, I die. The voltage makes me move my fingers, my mouth, my eyes. All this voltage is in the back of a Gita. It says that God is inside us, and, and the body is a playground for God. God it animates us. That's why we're called animated creatures. And inanimate creatures or inanimate things, like rocks and so on, they have no soul, but they have spirit. And if we start to look at uh, how uh, magnetism works and electromagnetism and gravity, it's all very, very simple because th there are three types of atom basically on Earth. Uh, the, the simplest of atom is, is the hydrogen atom. That simply has one negative charge, an electron, orbiting one positive charge in the middle. It's very, very simple. You can't get much simpler than that. The next most complicated atom is helium. And that has two electrons orbiting two protons. But it also has two neutrons, two neutron charges. Now, all of the other atoms are more complex than high, uh, helium. And that's, that they come into the third category of, of atom. So those are the three types of atom. Now, how gravity works is very simple. The electron going around the uh, hydrogen atom spins. And as it spins, it radiates electromagnetic waves. So we get a corkscrew wave, electromagnetic wave, coming off every single hydrogen atom. Now, the universe, 93% of our universe is made of hydrogen atoms, which is most of it. So clearly, all of the hydrogen atoms are pointing in different directions, and there's an awful lot of them. So all of these hydrogen atoms, in water, for example, that's made of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, two hydrogen uh, atoms and one oxygen atom, all of the hydrogen atoms in water are sending out corkscrew-style radio waves, electromagnetic waves. And those corkscrew-style waves collide with neighboring atoms, the more complex ones. It could be magnesium, it could be calcium, it could be boron, it could be any of the other 120 elements. Now, none of the other elements spin like uh, hydrogen does, and that's because they have more than one electron. They tumble like tumbleweed in all directions because they have so many electrons moving about in different directions. They don't spin coherently like hydrogen. So under normal conditions, normal complicated atoms don't spin, they tumble. But when a hydrogen atom comes close to a neighboring atom, it causes that atom to spin like a water wheel. And as soon as the neighboring atom, be it calcium, magnesium, or whatever, begins to spin in the same direction as the hydrogen atom, then all of the electrons in that atom start to give off corkscrew energy. And that, that energy bombards other neighboring atoms in a straight line. So everything bombards everything else, and that's why everything attracts everything else. And because it's corkscrew in nature, it's like an Archimedes screw, a pump. If you put a screw thread into the water and turn it, water will move up the screw thread if it's inside a tube. That's right. That's right. This is excellent. This is very, very interesting. Our guest tonight, Maurice Cotterell, and we will come back and discuss all things that may even turn into, well, what the martial artists call key. Maurice Cotterell, would you, uh, would you amplify a little bit on, uh, didn't, didn't the dark one, the uh, safe? Didn't uh, refer to himself as the angel of light, and what's up with that? How does that uh, how does that fit into your studies? Well, the uh, if we go back to earlier, what I said was that everything on the right hand side, which is mass, the right hand side of Einstein's equation, is the devil. So. What that means is that the human body and the trees and the stars and the carpets and the microphones, everything in the physical world is the devil or Satan. Living things also have God inside them. So a human being has a body which is the devil and a soul inside which is God. So we're 50% God, 50% devil. So good ideas come from God, bad ideas come from the body. And most people appreciate that when we leave home every morning and close the door behind us, we enter a battlefield in hell. But few appreciate that the battle continues to rage within each and every one of us 
every moment of our lives, no matter where we are. So this is hell. We are all living in hell. And the idea is, is, is to escape. I mean, for many years... For many years, I thought it was the right thing to do to make the world a better place. And ev everything I did was towards that aim, to try to make a world a better place for everybody to live in. But once I realized that this world was hell, then it seemed to me that if I made the world better, I was just creating a better hell. So it was not the right thing to do. Clearly, if you're in a prison camp, hell, then what you need to do is escape. And this is another reason why the knowledge is secret, because if everybody tries to escape at the same time, then we all get rounded up and caught and brought back to prison again. But if you keep it secret and don't tell anybody when you plan to leave, then you can dig the tunnel on your own, leave the tunnel, and nobody will miss you for quite some time. So this is how the Freemasons are operating. They don't want you to know the knowledge they know, because if everybody tries to escape, God will stop growing. And the whole purpose of existence is to accommodate God growth, to allow the love in the universe to increase continually. So that's the reason why, uh, as I say, the, the body is uh, the devil, the soul inside is God, and we have to recognize that we have a choice between accepting ideas from the body, the five senses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, and the touch, or to uh, accept ideas that come from God into our electromagnetic energy bank, our soul, if you like. So all of the knowledge in my book, for example, although I say my book, it's not my book because I didn't write it. It comes through me into the world. It's God's work. I don't believe any human being could set down which, what is set down in the book. And you may agree with that. Uh, it, it's not the sort of thing that you can deduce. What few people realize is that God is in every single one of us. We are all God. We are all the same energy. And when we die, some of us will go back to God this time. Some of us will reincarnate. And, but eventually we'll all go to God after billions and billions of years. Uh, the ancients believed that there were three uh, transitory states, if you like. One was the God world, where God lives. One was the uh, soul world, which is divided up into purgatory and hell. And it's a bit like a, a factory where purgatory is like the reception to hell. And hell itself is the factory itself. And if we are uh, planet Earth, we can uh, live on planet Earth in this incarnation. And this is like the reception. This is purgatory where our sins are purged. Now, I know this because all of the decoded pictures that the Mayas left behind, and the Egyptians, and the Incas, and the Celtic people, and the ancient Chinese, all of these people that worshipped the sun thousands of years ago, they left all of this knowledge behind. All I had to do was decode it. Once I decoded it, I could see what the messages were trying to convey. All we have to do is uh, get the energy, purify our soul, and go to heaven. It, it's, there's nothing difficult about it once we understand that. The voltage that you refer to, or is that, or now one more time, is this literal or metaphorical voltage? Oh, it's actually a literal voltage. The, the voltage itself is, is electromagnetic energy. Okay, and gotcha. We, and we know that because in the Bible it says, uh, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Light is electromagnetic energy. That's how we describe it. And as I say in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, uh, God is light. It's quite specific. And in the Dharmapada of the Buddhist, it says Buddha was the enlightened one. And the same with Krishna. 5,000 years ago, if the Egyptians encoded information into their pyramids, it wasn't encoded for me today. It was encoded for themselves if they came back, because they know they would come back if they didn't make it to heaven, that they could start where they left off from uh, with the pyramid, knowledge uh, wrapped up in the pyramids and not start at the beginning again. And what we find is with the ancient civilizations is that there are lots of rules to the reincarnation process. And one of them seems to be that we come back to the same DNA. So clearly, if you've got no DNA, there's less chance of you coming back. But this is why priests and clerics don't have children, because that's why they're celibate, and why nuns are celibate. If they don't have kids, there's less chance they'll come back. If they've been bad, they'll come back as a cat or a dog or a worm, of course. But if they've been good, 
then they, they won't come back at all. They're guaranteed to get to heaven. So uh, these mechanisms of the soul world are many and various. Uh, for example, and, and they're all, there's clues to them all in the world around us. There are, there are lots of mechanisms uh, in regarding the, the light of the, the, the soul and uh, the inverse transmigration of the soul. And Tutankhamun mentions this in, in his treasures. Um, basically, he says that black people come as white people and white people come back as black people. Fat people come back as thin people. Thin people come back as fat people. Tall people become short. Short people become tall. And so eventually we find all of the different states of being we experience and, and we suffer uh, in different states of being as we come back. So if we're unkind in one incarnation, in the next incarnation we get it all back again. This is the notion of karma. Uh, the Christians call it original sin, Adam and Eve, if you like. But it's, it's, it's not, it's actually karmic. It's the negativity that we've generated from a previous incarnation. And this... Uh, the Tibetans referred to the godly energy as chi. These people were super intelligent beings, and they came to teach us about God and what heaven is. Uh, there's much more to life than we see around us in this physical world. This physical world is purgatory. It can get worse. We can go to the sun when we die, and that's hellfire. You know, if, if we don't purge our hearts, in, in purgatory, while we're on earth, then we'll, we can either go to the sun, where it's very warm, as you can appreciate, or we can stay in purgatory for 3,740 years until the sun's magnetic field changes and releases us, and then we, we can live again in another lifetime, in a different incarnation. And it's important to realize that every religion subscribes to reincarnation. You know, some Christians jump up and down and say, oh, no, we don't. We stopped believing in reincarnation in A.D. 200 and things like that. But it's not true. If you look at the, the precepts of Christianity, they advocate that there's a body and a soul. If we live a good life, the soul goes to heaven. If we don't, the soul goes to hell. What I've shown using Einstein's equation is that this, this life is hell. The earth is hell, which means that if the soul comes back to earth, if it reincarnates to hell, it comes back to earth. So even Christians, whether they like to believe it or not, believe in reincarnation, that the soul comes back to earth. But firstly, they've got to get their heads around the fact that Einstein's equation is correct. And if it were not correct, the atom bomb wouldn't explode. The atom bomb does explode. Einstein's equation does appear to be correct. A lot of his other work is not. But... Uh, this explains why there is such injustice in the earth, because some people have led bad lives in, pre in their previous incarnations. And we have to suffer for it. We have to... Uh, suffering purifies the heart, uh, because when we suffer, the brain and the heart go into battle. It's like a battlefield within it. The intellect and the heart fight it out. The, the intellect says, I'm suffering. Why am I suffering? And it squeezes the heart and the heart is squeezed of impurity as a wet rag is squeezed of water. When the heart becomes emptied of impurity, it can then empty impurity from the soul. So uh, an impure soul empties into an empty heart. But if the heart is full of impurity, the soul cannot enter, empty into it. So we have this physical mechanism and a spiritual mechanism which accommodates soul, uh, increasing soul voltage which enables us to escape from this incarnation and go back to God, the Creator. You know, and people, one of the most common questions people do raise is how can uh, God be good when he allows earthquakes and things like that to happen, so-called bad things on earth. But it's not bad once you get your head around it. I mean, the moon goes around the earth and the, the earth goes around the sun and we have to do this because we're, th th these planets have to do this because we're alive. You know, we have day and night. We have the seasons. Uh, the body has to heal itself, otherwise it dies. So when God put all of the pieces together to make sure that the body heals itself, to make sure we have day and night so that we can get some rest, there was a few problems with the model. For example, when the Earth goes around the sun, the gravitational field changes depending where the Earth is, the strength of it. As the moon goes around the Earth, the pull on the Earth changes. 
And if we, that causes the tectonic plates to move around, which we call earthquakes. Now, if they didn't move around, if it was rigid, the earth would just shatter and six billion people would be killed. So you have a choice now, if you're God, you have a choice of either killing six billion people and smashing the earth to bits, or you can have an earthquake every year and lose 50,000. What would you rather have? Now, clearly, God wants the world and the universe to last forever. And another indicator of this is the fact that he created astrology. Because one of the problems with human beings is, is that we, if we all agreed all the time, the world would end. Because sooner or later, somebody on the earth would say, they'd come up with an idea, and they'd say, I'm going to commit suicide. Well, if everybody agreed, then everybody on the earth would commit suicide. And human nature would stop, and God would stop growing. So to stop this happening, God has to make us all argue all the time. And the only way he could make us argue all the time was to make sure that we were all astrologically different, that we were of 12 different signs of the zodiac. So when one person says, I'm going to commit suicide, other people say, well, you know, that's for you to decide. It's not for me to decide. I'm not going to commit suicide. So the human race continues. It doesn't end. So this is one of the mechanisms, like the healing, like the astronomy, and all the rest of it, to make sure that God's world is absolutely perfect. So although it seems we are in hell, and lots of bad things happen in hell, we are we, we, given an opportunity of escaping from this hell and becoming one with God again at the end of this life, or certainly in a few thousand years' time. So all of these things are connected. And they're all connected through this window of astrology. Once we get into astrology, we start asking questions which lead us into knowledge in, in associated areas. And for those who are interested in how astrology works, well, there are two schools of astrology. Sun sign astrology used in the West recognizes that the sun causes 12 types of personality each year. Whereas Chinese astrology recognizes that the sun causes 12 types of personality every 12 years, a different one every year. Both believe that the sun's radiation and position of the planets affect our day-to-day -day biorhythms and behavior. Now, what we know is that uh, from data from scientific instruments over the last 50 years, we, knew, we now understand that our sun spins like a spinning top every 28 days. And as it, as it spins, it gives off particles, positive particles and negative particles throughout the year. The particles collide with the Van Allen radiation belts which encircle the Earth. And this causes the magnetic field of the Earth to change. It modulates. It gets stronger and weaker with the bombardment of particles. Changes in magnetic fields cause genetic mutations to developing fetuses in the womb as the egg uh, is uh, fertilized by the sperm and the chromosomes begin to divide and the cells begin to divide. Then uh, the person, the uh, the genetic makeup of the person, the baby changes, and we believe that personality is caused primarily by uh, genetic mutations. We know this from studies on twins going back to the early 1920s, Johannes Lange, one of the early psychologists in, in Germany did lots of experiments on twins. He concluded that personality must be genetically determined. We also know that 28-day uh, magnetic cycles cause variations in the hormone melatonin, which regulates the 14-day, it regulates the 14-day emotional biorhythm in humans. The 28-day changes in the production of the female fertile, fertility hormones, oxygen and progesterone, are caused in the same way, which means that the 28-spinning sun regulates fertility in females on Earth. And this is why the Mayas, Egyptians, Peruvians, Celts, and Chinese worship the sun as the god of fertility and the god of astrology. And again, all of this is in, explained in future science. If you understand the rules of life, if you understand how astrology works, if you understand the rules of the game, then life becomes a lot easier and simpler. Uh, we can, uh, you know, why make life difficult when we can make life easy? And once we understand which types we vibrate with, which astrological signs that we get on with or who don't bring the best out in us, then we can pick a team of people that will be successful with ourselves and avoid those who make the spirit uncomfortable within us, or vexatious if you like, and bring us too much pain.
Even though pain purifies the soul, we, try to, we are programmed to avoid pain. Otherwise, again, it's one of these mechanisms like earthquakes. If we didn't avoid pain, we'd all die, and that's not part of the grand plan. So we need pain, but in moderation. Not too much because it would kill us, but just enough so that we survive, get back up on our feet, start walking again, and experience more of life to acquire wisdom and the knowledge to help us escape. The problem is the knowledge in the wrong hands can be destructive. Now, you know, Freemasons believe in astrology, uh, and they understand how astrology works. We understand, you and I, because we've read Future Science, how astrology works and why, why we have astrology. And it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, but in the wrong hands, people could start to send their adversaries to hell. And you can do this, there are various ways. I can, tell, I can reveal one way by way of example, of sending somebody to hell, for example. Uh, I could ask somebody to do God's work, and they could say no. People who do God's work go to heaven. People who say no go to hell. So that's one way. Now, I know what God's work is, so I can, I can reveal that mechanism, because other people who might, miss, might abuse this mechanism don't know what God's work is anyway, so they're never going to ask somebody to do it. But there are several ways that we can send other people to hell, and we don't want to do that because we bypass the, the purification mechanism. Let me ask you something real quick. My and Vedic Chinese astrology, do they agree on anything? And which one do you focus on the most closely, any or all or a combination? They're all uh, based on the sunspot cycle, and they all agree. Uh, it's just different ways of looking at the same thing. Uh, it's like Western astrology looks at the months. Uh, Chinese astrology looks at the years. But you actually have to bring them all together to get a complete picture. For example, if you bring the 12... Western signs together with the 12 Chinese annual signs together, we get 144 astrological combinations. Now it gets complicated. You can be more specific and more detailed in your analysis and your predictions. So they're all of value, and they all work because of the sun. And you're asking why the dragon is so special. The dragon is a sunspot maximum, which is this year. So... Uh, there's an inverse relationship between sunspot maximums and cosmic rays striking the Earth. So what we find is that during a sunspot maximum, minimum cosmic rays strike the fetus during its gestation period. So the dragon, the resulting dragon which is born, uh, is, is more, in, I say this, more intelligent. Let me explain why I say that, more gifted. I know this because of the research I've done on honeybees. And I, not many people probably appreciate this, but there are, clearly there are three types of honeybee. You've got the worker, the drone, and the queen. And they have different gestation periods. The interesting thing that most people don't know is that usually there's only about four or five queen cells laid in a hive. But if something happens like a disaster to the hive, and all of those five queens are killed, the worker bee drags a worker maggot out of its cell, takes it from being horizontal, turns it in, into a vertical orientation, and the worker maggot becomes a queen. Now, scientists say that this is impossible. After all, it seems the only thing that's changed is that the, the worker bees feed the, the new queen-to-be royal jelly instead of pollen and honey during its, uh, its, its gestation period. So science says you can't alter the genetic combination. You can't alter the genes of something through diet. That's what modern science dictates. So nobody understands how you can take a worker maggot, turn it vertically, and turn it into a, a queen bee, which is bigger, hairier, and completely different to a worker. What I, my experiments I showed was that when you turn it Vertically, the queen, the worker bee, is subjected to electric radiation instead of magnetic radiation. Not only that, but the gestation period for the queen is only 16 days, the new queen, whereas for a wor normal worker bee, it's 21 days. So the new queen only gets 16 days in a microwave oven, if you like, whereas the worker bee gets 21 days in the same microwave oven, which is 90 degrees to the other queen. What this means is that the queen bee 
is converted not because of the diet, but because of the genetic mutations caused by the 90 degree change in its orientation, which means it's subjected to electric rather than magnetic radiation because the two are 90 degrees apart. So what we're saying is that by reducing the amount of radiation, the honeybee becomes bigger, cleverer, and turns into a queen. In the same way, sunspot maximums lead to radiation minimums on Earth, <coughs> which lead to dragons, which are more clever, more talented. They're the queen bee of the zodiac rather than the worker bee. And that's why waves of every 12 years, there's a 12-year cycle in the Chinese astrological calendar. It starts off with the year of the rat, which is followed by the ox, which is followed by the tiger, the rabbit, the dragon, the snake, the horse, the sheep, the monkey, the rooster, the dog, the pig. Twelve years. And these years happen, recur, repeat every 12 years. And we, if you go back to 1900, the calendar began with the rat. So 1912 was a rat, 24 was a rat, 36 was a rat, 48 was a rat, and so on. In the same way, 2000, the year 2000 was the year of the dragon. So 2012 is the year of the dragon every 12 years. And if you go back to pop groups of the 60s like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, they are all years of the dragon. They were all born, for example, 12 years before me. I'm the year of the water dragon. But they were 12 years younger than me. So during the 60s, they were age 24 and I was age 12. And I became a teenager as the Beatles became more and more popular. And whenever we get flowering, blossoming of art or music, pop music or uh, new inventions, you'll find that the classroom of the day, the classroom of graduates, were dragons. These are the ones that change everything and turn the world upside down. And that's why this year, the sunspot maximum, the sunspot maximum uh, causes more evaporation of water from the oceans. That leads to more clouds above the oceans. Which, mean, which blocks out the solar radiation. And that's why there's an inverse relationship between sunspots and cosmic rays bombarding the Earth. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, it's inverse, it's opposite. So a sunspot maximum, minimum cosmic rays, uh, minimum mutations to the fetus in the womb. The fetus of the womb is, is born with all of its faculties not being burned out like a worker like a worker bee, is born with all of its faculties intact. That explains why the Year of the Dragon is, is so special. And experiments have been done in psycho psychology that the brain is affected by magnetic fields and that the performance of the brain can be improved and increased by uh, subjecting the pineal gland to magnetic fields. Tell us how, in your opinion, we should live our lives. You mentioned doing God's work earlier. What might that be, and, and what would you admonish people to do over the, uh, the course of the year, other than not worry? Well, you have to do exactly what Jesus said. You know, if we simplify everything we've been talking about for the past few hours, uh, you can use the expression, uh, love God and love your neighbor. Look after the pennies and the pounds, look after themselves, if you like. Because if you love God and love your neighbor, your voltage will grow, and when it leaves your body, you'll go to heaven and become one with God again. And uh, that's it. You'll go to heaven instead of coming back here again. All right. Um, well, so we can, well, we're going to be waiting a while then. All these, the, these geniuses and talented people, we're going to have to wait a couple of decades before, um, before their, their work is realized. Well, that goes for all of us. I mean, uh, if, uh, very often our work isn't realized until after we're dead for various reasons. And, you know, a lot of this work probably won't be because the people who, who subscribe to the model of the day to smashing atoms apart and accelerators and things like that, there's no incentive for them to uh, discover how gravity works. If they're going to get paid $5 billion a year not to discover how it works, why... You know, why discover how it works? There's no incentive there for them. You know, there's no incentive for, for them to subscribe to science. Why bother? Uh, the, the true scientists are the amateur scientists. Those are the ones who are driven by scientific inquiry and not by ego. If you look at scientists, 
All they care about is themselves, their jobs, their money. They, they, if they do discover anything, they have no rights to it because they've sold their soul to the, the drug manufacturer or whoever wants the patent. They can't criticize uh, their other people's work because of the, they've got to answer to the people who pay them, their wages. Exactly. And uh, it, it's, the whole world is, is hell. You know, as we said earlier, it is how. As long as you know it's how, you can understand how it works and how we're not going to change it. So the best thing you can do is, is try to escape, purify your soul, try to become peaceful inside, realize that we're all at the same energy. The trees, the plants, the uh, animals, we all have souls. And our generation will be wiped out one day. There's no question about this. So now what do you make of the, the end of the Mayan calendar? Well, there is no end to the Mayan calendar, and I can tell you the story behind the story, if Please. you like. I took my book, The Mayan Prophecies, to uh, a publisher in 1994 called Element Books Limited. And they agreed, it was all about the Maya in Palenque and uh, sunspots and the, early, the earlier work. And uh, they said they'd publish it, but they wanted it jazzed up to make it more popular. Uh, well, I said, look, you don't seem to understand what this work's like. It's, uh, it's already popular, and when people get hold of it, you know, it, it'll immediately become obvious why it's so popular. But being a publisher of the day, they refused to spend any money on the book. They refused to take time on the book. In fact, after that book, I did the artwork myself. All of the, the artwork in the new books, for example, I've done myself because nobody in the world can do it like me. So I had to do it. That's why it's a lot better. But in the early days, they said we want to make it popular. Another reason they didn't need to say that was because a fan of my work was Lord Rothermere. And he owned the Daily... He's, he's died since then, sadly. But he owned uh, the Daily Mail newspaper in England, which is the largest... It's not the largest daily uh, selling newspaper, but it's, it's a national newspaper which sells in middle-class circles the uh, down market papers sell a lot more because they had naked women on page three and so on. But of the quality tabloids, if you like, the Daily Mail is the biggest, and they serialize books. And Lord Rothermere had already agreed to serialize my work when the book appeared. So, you know, they didn't need to popularize it. The Daily Mail were going to do that anyway. Uh, anyway, the uh, publisher's element crook said, look, we're not going to publish it unless you allow us to, to pick somebody to rewrite it and popularize it. So reluctantly, in order to get the scientific work published, I agreed, although I, didn't, I wasn't happy about it. In fact, I gave half of the book away, essentially, which I didn't want to do, but they wouldn't publish it unless I did. So I showed how the sun affected life on Earth, and they got this other guy, a friend of the chairman of the publishers, to so-called rewrite it. What, he, what I said was, the Maya died out in AD 750, 1,250 years ago, because of a solar magnetic reversal, which caused uh, a mini ice age on Earth. That's what happens when you have a solar magnetic reversal. Uh, lower female fertility, so they had less babies. It caused increased X-rays, because uh, X-rays strike the Earth more perpendicularly around the equator than the North Pole and the South Pole. So the X-rays from the sun, which increase during a sunspot maximum, have more effect on equatorial regions like Mexico. So uh, what happened was the, the Maya died out through several factors in AD 750. They had uh, a drought because of a mini ice age, less water evaporated from the oceans. They were, had more infant mortality uh, because the x-rays damage the fetus in the womb, causing spontaneous fetal abortion, uh, and, and so on. And what Element tried to say was, they said two things. One, the Mayan calendar ends in 2012, which it doesn't. And the second thing is that the Mayan, uh, so that the whole world will die out in 2012 due to infertility, due to x-rays, due to a drought, and so on. And I said, well, no, it's not going to happen in uh, 2012. In fact, if we look at when the 11.49-year cycle ends, that won't reach a maximum uh, until uh, the, now, the, the year of the dragon. 
the 187-year cycle won't end until 2087, and the, uh, the next solar reversal won't happen until the year 4,367. They said, we don't care. We're going to tell people the calendar ends, that all of the cycles come together, and uh, the world will end at that time. I said, well, it's not like that. If you look at the scholar, uh, the work of S.G. Morley, the Mayan scholar of the 1940s, he said he identified uh, eight different cycles used by the Maya in their calendar. One day was called a kin. Twenty days was called a weenal. 360 days was called a ton. 7,200 days was called a katan. 144,000 days is called a bakton. 2,880,000 days is called a picton. 57,600,000 days is called a calabton. 1,152,000,000 days is called a kinchiliton. Now, four of those cycles come to an end this year, but four of them do not, clearly. So it's not the end of a calendar. In fact, this is the 13th cycle of 144,000 days. That's all it is. This year is the 13th of the 144,000 day cycle. And all of the others to the right, the Katan, the Tun, the Weenal, and the Kin are zero. But all of the cycles to the left, the billions of days, the millions of days, they're all still going. The calendar doesn't end. So it's nonsense. Anyway, they said, well, can't you say something in the book that it's going to end? And I said, no, the only connection I could make is that there's possibly a connection with a precession cycle if you examine the cycles. But that's not hard and fast. It's not, you know, I'm not saying there is, but there could be. So the book was published. It was serialized in the Daily Mail. It was translated into about 25 languages. It became a bestseller. The next thing I knew, there was two or three American authors who all came out with books saying the world's going to end in 2012 because <clears throat> the magnetic field of the sun's going to reverse, the Earth's going to align with a galactic equator, all sorts of stuff out of midair. I don't know where they got it from. But it had no bearing whatsoever on science and no bearing whatsoever on the Mayan prophecies, which are listed in the books of Child and Balaam, the books of the Jaguar, or the books of the, the Golden Sun with its brown sunspots. Where is your book available? Where may it be obtained? Well, it was published in Ireland, and uh, although it's listed on Amazon.com and Amazon.co.uk, it can be ordered, but it's not stopped. The reason for that, uh, John, is because they only stock books which are discounted, and the book is such an expensive book to produce, we couldn't afford to discount it. So you can order it through Amazon, but you can get it directly off my website. You can get signed copies off www.morriscottrell.com. Alternatively, I've donated about 20 copies to the U.S. library system. So if you don't wish to buy a copy, you can get one for free anyway on loan from the U.S. library, although you may have to wait until it's posted to you. I'm not sure how your system works. But uh, anybody who wants a copy, log on to my website, and you can order one through PayPal. Thank you. Uh, I, I was looking at the book. It's, it's a, it's a, it is a very expensive book. It's, it's, uh, it's one of those books that will last 100 years. Excellent uh, plates, uh, very interesting photographs. It's very well written and, and a very good, uh, just an excellent piece of work. My compliments.